How hard would it be to terraform Venus? When people start talking about terraforming, Mars usually steals the spotlight. It's colder, drier, and more barren than Earth, but at least not trying to melt your face off. Venus, on the other hand, once thought to be a paradise planet, now has a reputation as a hellish twin. Scorching hot, cloaked in thick clouds of carbon dioxide, and hostile to life as we know it. But what have we been looking at it all wrong? Venus is almost exactly the same size and mass as Earth. It has similar gravity, a rocky surface, and a thick atmosphere, albeit one that's wildly unfriendly right now. While Mars needs to be bulked up with an atmosphere and warmed considerably, Venus already has too much atmosphere and too much heat. The real trick is figuring out how to take some away, and if we could pull that off, Venus wouldn't just be habitable, it could be even more Earth-like than Mars ever could. Today we'll briefly explore just how hard it would be to terraform Venus, looking at both the wild and the practical ideas proposed over the years. Along the way we'll see why turning Venus into a second Earth might be one of humanity's greatest and most worthwhile challenges. As our aim today is to offer a concise summary of options and approaches for folks newer to the topic, we will skim some ideas we've covered in more depth elsewhere, like in Winter on Venus or our recent two and a half hour long terraforming compendium. Indeed, when writing that compendium, I wanted to talk more about Venus specifically, but didn't want the compendium overly focused on any one planet, as we probably have about a trillion in this galaxy to potentially settle. So I decided it deserved its own treatment, and since we're experimenting with a new show visual style, it seemed like a good time. Why Venus? At first, Venus doesn't seem like a promising destination, at least not the surface. We might be able to set up early settlements floating as cloud cities in the upper atmosphere, but down below, temperatures are hot enough to melt lead, and the atmospheric pressure is over 90 times that of Earth's. In fact, as we'll get to later, the pressure is so high that if we cool it down a bit, we could have lakes of liquid carbon dioxide on the surface. Stand on the surface without protection and you'd be crushed and cooked in seconds, and that protection would be hard to maintain. You would need quite the power supply and insulation just to keep cool in a habitat on the ground. Thanks to the Cube Square Law, bigger habitats or domes are easier to keep cool, but it's an uphill battle to build and power a cooling system. Given how most reactors generate heat as a byproduct, your best bet might actually be large microwave beam receiving stations to power your cooling systems remotely from large solar arrays in orbit. Needless to say, this is not ideal for settlement, but it is a reminder of a core principle we have on this show, just about anything is possible with enough imagination, or sheer effort. And if brute force isn't working, you're not using enough of it. You might be able to establish long-term habitation modules for work crews down there, but most would probably be limited to running robots. Stepping outside in any sort of regular spacesuit would be a fast way to find out firsthand just how much Venus really resembles hell. Not a nice place. And when you add in clouds laced with sulfuric acid, it's easy to see why Venus gets such a bad rap. Yet for all its hostility, Venus has some remarkable advantages. First, its gravity is about 90% of Earth's, meaning humans could live there long term without suffering the muscle and bone degradation we expect on low gravity worlds like Mars or the Moon. It also means most ecosystems wouldn't need heavy-handed management or genetic engineering once we got the temperature and daylight right. Its size and mass are close to Earth's too, suggesting it could hold on to an atmosphere over geological timescales better than Mars. Though Venus has little in the way of a magnetosphere, it does have tons of atmosphere, so you might think the former is unnecessary. But it is worth noting that Venus has virtually no hydrogen or helium, the two most common elements in the Universe because both are easily stripped away by solar wind and cosmic rays, which a magnetosphere would protect against. We need to bring in a lot of hydrogen if we want oceans on Venus, at least ones made of water, and we'll need to keep that hydrogen safe from stripping effects. If you didn't know, what we call cosmic rays and solar wind are mostly hydrogen atoms, stripped of their electrons, just lone, very fast-moving protons. They're moving dozens of times faster than a plant's escape velocity, so when they hit a planet, they tend to keep going, but when they hit atmospheric particles, they can knock them free too. Lighter particles like hydrogen and helium are especially vulnerable. 
Their electric charge also allows a magnetic field to deflect them. While generating a magnetic field strong enough for planetary defense is challenging, it is easier if you intercept particles far from the planet, which leads to one of the more intriguing ideas we'll discuss, setting up a magnetic field generator at Venus's L1 point, powered by solar panels that also block some sunlight. There's also the question of resources. Venus has abundant carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and sulfur compounds, raw materials can be reworked into a habitable environment. Solar power is another huge plus. Sitting closer to the Sun, Venus receives roughly double the solar energy that Earth does, making an ideal candidate for solar-based industries or giant power stations to fuel terraforming efforts. Finally, while Mars needs massive atmospheric and temperature boosts to be marginally habitable, Venus merely needs a climate adjustment. If we can find ways to strip away the excess heat and pressure, we might end up with a world far more Earth-like than anything Mars can offer. In many ways, Venus is less a lifeless rock and more of an overcooked Earth, one that might be cooled and tamed with the right technology and a lot of patience. Cooling Venus, Methods and Challenges Terraforming Venus starts with one daunting task, getting the temperature down. Before we can think about changing air or adding water, we need to turn down the heat. Fortunately, there are a few ideas on how to do that. Solar Shades at the L1 Lagrange Point One of the more elegant proposals involves parking a giant solar shade between Venus and the Sun, at what's known as the L1 Lagrange Point. This is a spot where the gravitational forces of Venus and the Sun balance perfectly, allowing an object to stay fixed relative to both. If we place a massive light reflecting sail or swarm or smaller mirrors there, we could reduce the sunlight reaching Venus and gradually cool the planet down. The advantages are huge. There's no need for messy explosions or risky engineering on the surface itself, just a controlled, gentle dimming of the sunlight. Venus would begin to lose heat naturally, allowing the atmosphere to cool and possibly condense. The challenges sound staggering. Venus is almost as big as Earth so you need a sunshade many millions of square kilometers in area, roughly the size of the continental United States, if not bigger. Building something that large and keeping it stable would be a feat of engineering unlike anything humanity has ever attempted, and yet it might be easier than it sounds like. A swarm of thin panels placed between Venus and the Sun, not quite at L1, can achieve five things. Blocking light, regulating daytime if you block it all, powering magnets to deflect ions, send power back to Venus and its orbital industries, and potentially bag some hydrogen for use on Venus rather than simply deflecting it. Now the reason the sunshade wouldn't sit exactly at Venus's L1 Lagrange point is that we're not dealing with a typical object. L1 is the spot where an object can stay balanced between a planet and the Sun, matching the planet's orbit. However, if you use very thin panels, just a few microns thick, they get pushed around by solar radiation pressure like an enormous solar sail. And that disrupts the usual orbital mechanics. As a result, the shade needs to be placed slightly closer to the Sun to balance the extra force. Even so, the required mass isn't as intimidating as it sounds. A planet-wide disk just a few microns thick would only weigh a few trillion kilograms. That might seem huge, but it's about two years worth of Earth's current steel production or the mass of a modest metallic asteroid, of which the solar system has untold thousands. Given that the prize is an entire new planet, that's a bargain. This wouldn't be a single sheet, though technically it could be. More likely it would be an array of thin panels, and we want Venus to have Earth-like day and night cycles, we could rotate half the panel's edge onto the Sun during the day to let the light through, then rotate them back to simulate dusk and night. Venus, after all, has a natural day length of 243 Earth days, painfully slow, and no significant magnetic field because of it. Even a fraction of sunlight hitting the panels could power a magnetic shield for Venus, far stronger than Earth's own magnetosphere. If you've seen our terraforming compendium, you know I'm a big fan of L1 magnetic deflectors. I suspect they'll become standard for terraforming projects, and maybe even for Earth itself, to help clean out radiation belts like the Van Allen belts that pose hazards to orbital infrastructure. And since you'd have all that solar power available, why not put it to good use? It could beam down power to Venus's orbiting facilities, or even beyond, 
to Earth, Mars, Titan, or other future colonies, it could support settlements on Jupiter's sun-starved moons in exchange for hydrogen or water, both abundant in the outer solar system, or perhaps it could use magnetic deflectors to scoop up hydrogen from the solar wind to ship back to Venus where there's already abundant oxygen, ready to be combined into water. For me, this is the big path to making Venus habitable. If you are rotating parts of that shade, it will be visibly indistinguishable from the natural Sun, too. Beyond that you don't look at the Sun directly, especially on Venus, they are just too visually small to amount to the human eye equivalent of a pixel. So again, I think it's a good approach for many wards and for hot ones, you wait patiently as the planet cools, possibly keeping the days a lot less bright than you eventually want to help cool it faster initially, but we have other methods and we still have that big thick atmosphere to handle. Nuking or beaming the atmosphere. For those who prefer a more aggressive approach, there's the idea of blasting Venus's atmosphere away using nuclear weapons. The concept is to detonate a series of large nuclear devices high in the atmosphere, giving the gas enough energy to escape Venus's gravity. Another variant is using focused solar energy beams, essentially giant lasers or microwave emitters, to heat the upper atmosphere and drive the gases off into space. This works well in tandem with that L1 shade I mentioned that's glitting itself on huge amounts of solar energy that you might as well put to use, and a concentrated beam on a planet will rip off the atmosphere a lot faster than the same amount of energy diffused over the whole planet. While these approaches would be faster, it's not without massive downsides. Radiation on the surface from nukes is a minimal concern, but you are putting a lot of gas into space that is blowing Earth's direction now, though you could probably time your efforts to leave us alone. You are also wasting all that convenient and useful matter. Carbon Dioxide Liquefaction and Freezing A third strategy focuses on cooling Venus until its carbon dioxide rich atmosphere condenses, On Earth's surface conditions, carbon dioxide does not form a liquid, only a solid or gas, but under Venus's immense pressures it can condense into vast oceans of liquid CO2 as we cool the planet. This sounds easier than blasting the atmosphere into space, but it comes with its own challenges. What do you do with the oceans of liquid carbon dioxide? You can't just let it sit there, it would boil back up as soon as you got the pressure and temperature anywhere near where a human can survive. So it needs to be stored, sequestered, or chemically converted to something safer and more useful. Fortunately, carbon and oxygen are both useful building materials when separated, and we can always find useful projects if we think a bit bigger. Ward Houses and Floors Another option for cooling a planet and keeping it cool is to construct a ward house, either a patchwork of domes or a giant crystal shell around the planet. You could make the surface shaded or reflective to help regulate lighting and temperature. I tend to think this works best in tandem with Lagrangian or orbital shades and mirrors, rather than on its own. For smaller ward houses, very large domes but not planet sized, these can be used to create warmer settlements by providing insulation or by adding focused light from orbital mirrors, while the rest of the planet remains cooled and possibly even kept in near darkness. This raises another important point. We might not just build roofs over the planet, but also floors over the natural terrain. Floors make a lot of sense in the terraforming context, and on Venus they may be the best initial approach for handling the carbon dioxide. Whether CO2 is a gas or a liquid depends on temperature and pressure, and you can seal it in by placing a covering layer over it, or several layers for redundancy, using their weight to maintain high pressure. Every 10 meters of water adds roughly 1 atmosphere of pressure, while 10 meters of rock or dirt adds about 2 to 3 atmospheres depending on its density. You need about 60 atmospheres of pressure to liquefy carbon dioxide at room temperature, so you need to pile up quite a lot of material, several hundred feet of dirt at least. Fortunately, all the dirt you need is right there on Venus. Why cooling Venus might be easier than warming Mars. As daunting as these ideas are, they may actually be easier than warming up Mars. You can use the same trick with Mars in reverse. Put a halo mirror out at L1 to bounce more sunlight this way, but then we need to import lots of nitrogen for air, something Venus conveniently has in abundance. 
Cooling is hard, but blocking or reflecting sunlight is a straightforward energy budget. You're not adding heat, you're taking it away and using your excess sunlight to power the process. In short, while Venus is a hellscape today, the path to fixing it might be more achievable than turning Mars into a second Earth, especially given that Venus has considerably more useful land area than Mars. 90% of Earth's surface area versus 28% on Mars, and good old fashioned near normal gravity. Incidentally, the cooling process, if you block the Sun completely, or nearly so, is a couple centuries. Hardly quick, and there are ways to speed that up that we discussed in Winter on Venus, but not long to claim a whole new planet, and likely a lot faster than you could terraform Mars. There's a lot more to this process, of course. For one thing, you'd eventually need orbital mirrors, likely stationed at the L2 Lagrange point, to ensure both sides of the planet receive light. Venus rotates so slowly that simply pulsing sunlight at 24 hour intervals would only illuminate one hemisphere. That's probably something to add later in the process, though, since your first goal is cooling the planet well below Earth like temperatures to condense the atmosphere onto the surface. And of course, adding oceans of water and fixing Venus's extremely slow rotation would be long term projects, but with orbital mirrors and hydrogen imports from the outer system, both are achievable in time. During that period, you might have early settlements too, possibly on high mountain ranges or floating atop the newly formed seas of carbon dioxide. As we discussed in Colonizing Venus almost a decade ago, floating seas in Venus's upper atmosphere are quite feasible. And as the planet cools, they could gradually descend with the contracting atmosphere, eventually coming to rest gently on those CO2 oceans. That said, I tend to think planets are best terraformed while largely uninhabited. A couple of centuries isn't such a long wait when you can have orbital habitats operating from day one, supporting every phase of the process and ensuring humanity has a foothold even before the surface is ready. Terraforming Venus will be one of humanity's greatest engineering challenges but it is not impossible, with enough patience, energy, and creativity we could turn this hellish twin into a second Earth, perhaps even better suited to human life than Mars, cooling the planet, reshaping the atmosphere, importing water, and building new ecosystems would take centuries or more, but that's a small price to pay for gaining a new, fully Earth-like world. In the end, Venus might not just be a dream for far future science fiction, but the crown jewel of our efforts to expand life beyond Earth. And we need not choose between it and Mars, not only can we terraform and chew bubblegum at the same time, the efforts are likely to be complementary. Same as the argument about Mars versus the Moon, it's a false dichotomy. Which you do first might matter, but there's no reason not to do both, or in this case, all three and many others besides. As I like to say, think big. Because where space and our future is concerned, the sky is definitely not the limit, it's just the beginning.